Hello, I'm Kat Sarfis, bookseller at Barnes & Noble. Today, we are joined by the brilliant Kelly Link. Kelly is the best-selling author of the short story collections, Stranger Things Happen, Magic for Beginners, Pretty Monsters, Get in Trouble, a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in Fiction, and most recently, White Cat, Black Dog, a Barnes & Noble speculative monthly pick. Among other honors, she has won a Hugo Award, three Nebula Awards, a Shirley Jackson Award, a Lucas Award, and a World Fantasy Award for her fiction, and was one of the recipients of the 2018 MacArthur Genius Grant. She is the co-founder of Small Beer Press and the owner of Book Moon, an independent bookshop in East Hampton, Massachusetts. The Book of Love, her long-awaited debut novel, is both epic and intimate, a haunting and intoxicating tale of love, death, and magic, and one I can't stop talking about, Kelly, thank you so much for being here with us. This is absolutely my pleasure. Thank you for having me. So many know you as like a master of the short story, and I don't say that lightly. An author that sort of wields the weird and surreal as a very powerful and enjoyable tool. Your stories have captivated and enchanted so many readers. So I have to ask, what led you to Laura, to Daniel, Mo? to Susanna, to Lovesend, and this dizzying and generous first novel. Wow, thank you. <laughs> I am a short story writer, and I think I will always think of myself that way, but I am part of a local community of, of novelists. I do a lot of my writing with other people when circumstances permit um, with other writers. And the two writers that I write the most often with are Holly Black and Cassandra Clare. And I think that in part, I began thinking about novel writing because I wouldn't say I'm intimately engaged, but I am a very close up bystander of people <laughs> who year after year produce these really fantastic novels um, in a genre that I love to read. I also for years ran a small press with my husband. And I edited many of the novels that, that we published. And I think at a certain point after you listen to people talk about novels and you work with writers who are publishing their novels, um, and if you love novels as a reader, you start to think, this seems like it would be worth exploring, I guess. What, what could I do in a novel that I couldn't do in a short story? Mm -hmm. And the second part of that is when Random House bought my collection, get in trouble. They bought a second book, uh, a novel. And the reason why I sold them a novel was the writer Holly Black said to me, you are going to write a novel accidentally if you don't write one on purpose. And it would be much, much better to write one on purpose. And that made some sense to me. Yes, And I work really well the deadlines for a particular editor. And I thought, left on my own, I'll write the accidental novel, but if I sell it, then I will have to write it. And I had some ideas that I had been thinking about for a long time. I originally thought that I would write a short ghost story novel, and I think that I will do that. That will be my next adult <laughs> project. But I had been thinking about these kids coming back from the dead. I had been thinking about it as a trilogy and uh, what I thought when I put aside the ghost story novel, because I thought I, I don't have the heart for this right now. For whatever reason, I can't find my way in. But what if I began to think about the problem of how to make a trilogy into one, into one book? And I often begin a project by thinking about a technical problem. Um, and so in this case, the technical problem was how to condense something that should be three books into one book. And as you can see, uh, <laughs> the one of the parts of that solution is, well, it's going to be very long. Yes. Generous. I'll, I'll Generous. use that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you said long awaited and I thought you could just say long. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I mean, like I'm almost like embarrassed to show people. I have this beautiful arc here um, that has all these wonderful quotes on it um, and just a great description. And it is so beat up because I feel like I kind of, lived and breathed this book for a very long time and it just was like a constant companion and now that you're saying like that it was like it was a trilogy it makes me almost want to go back and like find those beats because I guess yeah now that I'm thinking about it there is 
there's arcs and there's like there there is a flow and there were points where I did almost feel like okay well that wrapped up and that but now what like what's how you know and then and then but then the story continues so that's really interesting I don't think I've ever had anyone say that like that that's how they are approaching uh, that's how they approached a novel I I don't think I'm sorry about this I think it would have been hard to pull off in a in a trilogy but I had an idea for a middle book, which involved not quite a standalone because the characters would have been the same, but they would have been more or less inside of a historical romance. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> which would have been a, a ton of fun to write. And I, you know, this book in, is in some ways my love letter to the romance genre that I don't work in, but that as a reader has given me enormous pleasure. But when I thought about writing, a historical romance novel, I thought, I'm still a reader of that. I'm, I'm not sure that I'm a, a writer in that, in, in that genre, in that format. In a way, with, with Lavender Glass and with, with Marianne, you kind of were able to sort of embody a romance writer and a character in a series of books and, and other books. And so that's, that's lovely. That's a nice little sneak in there <laughs> for you. Yeah, I, I don't think it's a spoiler to say that a, a secondary character in this book is is a romance writer, a very yes. successful one, who does follow that sort of, in many respects, punishing schedule of, of mm-hmm. putting out, you know, a book a year or more um, about one character, following the their their sort of their love life, and and you know. Part of the pleasure of thinking about that is, is if you write about the same characters over and over again, even if each book has a happy ending, you know that the next book happens because something bad has happened or something bad is going to be happened because that's what happens in books. Bad yes. things happen and, and people sort of navigate them. Yes. And I think that's even something I'm now trying to, I'm, I'm remembering, like, I think that's even a a, a point in the book where it's like, oh, poor, poor Lavender has to now go back. <laughs> She's going to be kidnapped again, or she's going to like something yeah. terrible. I'm sorry, something else terrible is going to happen to you. But this is just the way it goes, and this is yeah. how the series goes, and this is what the readers want. And I have to provide. And I think we even say somewhere, and it's where it does say, like you know, that 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 character, the romance Marianne, where you know she's written. I, I feel like you do give a number. It's it's some astronomical amount of books, and you think to yourself, like, how can anyone possibly write that many? But that is exactly what the schedule of romance writers, that is exactly what they do. Yeah. So that's crazy. Well, I love that. And so now I want to talk a little bit about the town. I love when a town sort of becomes a character in itself. And so the Book of Love takes place uh, in this fictional town of Lovesend, uh, Massachusetts, making this uh, novel kind of close to home in a way. Uh, If home, you know, we're full of magic and vengeful, uh, an eventual goddess. Uh, (laughs) The best fictional worlds are always hard to leave and this one is is really dazzling what uh what was your inspiration for love send the love send is a coastal town um in massachusetts and you know this is going to be a little bit digressive but my husband is from scotland i grew up in miami we both lived beside you know an ocean And we now live in Western Massachusetts. There's no ocean here, although there weirdly are many um, seafood checks. So many places (laughs) to get a lobster roll. uh, Why are they getting those lobster rolls? (laughs) Hopefully, you know, being driven the same day from somewhere on the coast. But And they're quite good. But I think that when I was imagining a town that I would like to write about, I thought about the fact that both of us are surprised that we no longer live in a city or a town beside the ocean um, and how much I love the ocean. And so I wanted to, I, I knew that I wanted the ocean to be in the book. I knew that I wanted a town that felt something like where I live. You know, I live in Northampton, Massachusetts. I work in my bookstores in East Hampton, Massachusetts, and they are both relatively small towns. My husband is constantly reminding me that we live in a rural area. You know, I think, well, it's a college town. He's like, well, it's a rural area. Yeah. And, you know, we're, we're both accurate. There are a lot of bookstores. There are a lot of quirky restaurants. Um, Checks all the boxes. <laughs> yeah. There are a lot of kids. You know, there's a lot of really weird retail spaces, some very fancy. And I think the thing that has changed about the place where I live, and I think this is true for a lot of people, is 
over the years, it's become more expensive. And so when I read about Love Sin, one of the things that I wanted was also to capture that sort of feeling of a small town that has access to some really beautiful, um, to the natural world. Uh, maybe it has a strong bike culture. It has these quirky restaurants, um, but it's not yet hit that point where the locals are priced out. Yeah, it's um, still accessible. Yeah. And so for me, you know, it's the kind of town that would be paradise. Yeah. I was going to say, I'm like, sounds like exactly like the kind of place that we all wish existed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think they exist for pockets of time and then they, mm-hmm. they sort of disappear again um, as, 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 you know, the world gets harder in other places. You've done a justice. You've cemented it in book form. I, I did. <laughs> I, I wanted, I wanted to preserve sort of that feeling when we first came here. And I, I say this realizing when we came here, uh, it was already beginning to change. But you know, things things are constantly changing everywhere. But this, you know, this this to me is is sort of the novel version of of the kind of small town that I've been lucky enough to live in for going on twenty years now. Wonderful. So talking about characters. So as much as I feel like the town is its own character, this is an impressive ensemble of characters um, that are uh, that are in this book. And I loved how, you know, you jump around, there's lots of points of view. I love how readers get to sort of delve into the minds of so many. And I loved how you label each chapter, the book of, I can't help it, I guess maybe because I'm a bookseller, but I do kind of think of our lives as like, you know, it's a book, it's our book, you know? And so I love that each chapter, you know, the book of Susanna, the book of Daniel, the book of Mo, and it does kind of put you in this, this mindset of like, this is their own book, their stories their motives, their desires, their struggles. And they're all so different from each other. Like, I felt like every character was almost like, and I'm sure you did, did this on purpose as most writers do, but it was just like that springboard for another character. But so I got to ask, and I know, I know it's, it's, it's terrible of me to, to ask this of you, but did you have a favorite person to write? Did you have a character where there was like a particular inspiration um, that you took for them? And I know it's like asking you to choose choose amongst <laughs> your children. So I know this is a wicked question. But when you have such an impressive ensemble, I have to think, did was there one character that stood out or was there one character at a time you enjoyed more than others? There are two characters that, that are sort of pulled from my life uh, in terms of uh, the dynamics between them. Um, Susanna and Lara, not not. Entirely. They're sisters. They're very close in age. They have a contentious relationship. Um, the older one, Susanna, is kind of a disaster. And she has a slightly younger sister, Lara, who knows what she wants to be, what she wants to do, has a real sense of the way that the world should work. Parts of their relationship is definitely drawn from the kind of relationship that I had with my sister when we were teenagers. We fought constantly. We did not understand each other's point of view. We had very different sense of our place in the world. So that aspect was um, comfortable, weirdly, to write from, even though yeah. it's a there's a lot of uh, fighting in their relationship. That dynamic was a comfortable one to explore. And I will say now my sister is wonderful. <laughs> we have a great relationship. But I sort of knew some of the boundaries of that relationship and some of the ways that they played off of each other. I love all of the characters. Thomas is somebody who's been alive for a long time. He sort of uh, navigates almost between different kinds of uh, voices. You know, he's been alive for such a long time. English was not his first language. Uh, So he has different registers. Um, that he speaks in, depending on if he's talking about his past, if he's, you know, um, sort of speaking to people who don't know who he was when he was first alive. And I found the that register, the more historical voice, really pleasurable to write in, that I felt very far removed from myself, but that it was a very weirdly, strangely easy place to write from. Um, and then there's a, another character, Bowie, uh, who is kind of a mystery, who has come back from the dead with a few of the other characters, but 
is not really the person that they they once were. And I found Bowie easy to write as well. I think in part because his point of view was so strange um, that that I was able to get outside my own head uh, when I was working in in Bowie's voice and thinking about what you were saying about not only just you know the, the different voices, but you do have quite a few characters that are are old. <laughs> and I, when I say old, I mean it's like ancient level old. And you do even speak about how they were what they are now is not what they once were. And so having, you know, evolved. And so it is interesting because to, you know, think about how, you know, they are speaking in one way and knowing that is that a, is that a, a throw, you know, to their former self. And now, you know, I'm kind of trying to meld their current situation or their current self and what they've evolved into. I did love when uh, a Bowie asks, what's a muffin? And, you know, again, that simplicity of, yes, this is, these are new things. Well, they might not seem new to us when you are a thousand years old or 500 years old, these things are new there, you know, and, and I think that that must be so enjoyable to really sit down and think if I'm a thousand years old, <laughs> what do I know? You know, if I've been think, trapped in some other dimension, yes. like while people came up with movies and, you know, all this other stuff. Yes. What would it be like to sit in that movie theater for the first time? And kind of experience that, that jump, yeah. you know, and in time. But then also that, that sort of evolution. Like, and I, you know, I love how even, you know, with, with Bogomil, I love how, um, you know, he is sort of the, the deviant in a way. And then, but it's like, he wasn't always that way. And, you know, and I think that, you know, kind of showing darkness changes us, but also just experience changes us. Trauma changes us. Relationships change us. Love changes us. Yes. There's a great deal of fun thinking about even minute changes, the big changes, the goofy changes, you know, and and of course, and also the parts of us that feel essential, you know, that, that, that we hold on to the longest you get into these characters heads these particularly like the the are you know are some of our teenage protagonists it can be frustrating but at the same time you're like that's exactly what a teenager would say <laughs> and it's like maddening you know but at, at the same time again everyone has and i think that you you even have characters will say that say like oh yeah i know i'm stupid now but i won't always be this way and it is that like realization that like i know what i know because i've of my experiences and what I've, what I've dealt with. But as you have lived a hundred years, I have lived at, you know, 16 or 18, you know, so it's like, give me, give me grace to sort of, you know, continue on sort of a different, a different trajectory. But speaking of love, I love the quote. I think uh, Lee Bardugo has a quote uh, that she gave for this book, calling it an eldritch hour town, which I felt like I saw that. And I was like, that's really interesting. And then I read it and I was like, yes, like, <laughs> like this is, <laughs> This is, if I was to have like a short pitch, like a a book sale and just like, what is this book? It was, I was like, that's a great, I don't know how that match, how she thought of that matchup, but Lee's brilliant. So again, I was just like, that's a great, um, that's just like spot on. The title of the book, The Book of Love, I do feel like while it is like you say that quote and then you look at the title and you're like, what? But it is so fitting because you do go into so many forms of love through like while all this chaos is, is happening. And I think you've even said yourself, it's there's love, there's romance, um, there's familiar love, there's platonic love, there's the ill-fated love. And this love, you know, it sort of transcends and it endures and it twists and it takes you on this journey on sort of the meanings of love. So I'm going to, and this is a big question. So I'm going to ask you, how do you look at love and Mm -hmm. how has that changed since writing this novel, since you've done so much, since you've gone on so many journeys? about love? That is a great, tough question. You know, it feels simplistic to say this, but I would like to think that that, uh, the best organizing principle as, as I get older is to sort of live by love, to tell the people that I love that I love them, to celebrate the things that I love or, you know, the books or the music the people who are doing extraordinary things to sort of, um, I guess, to to recognize that love is not a bad way to organize your life. You know, the other organizing principle that that I am 
deeply invested in is that, um, you know, wrath is anger is, is also sort of a useful organizing principle that we should be angry about, about certain kinds of things, you know, that, that if that anger can be a kind of fuel as well, but not to let anger crowd out love. Yes. But I mean, in a way, I mean, not all anger. I I just preface by saying that. Absolutely. But um, I think anger can, I mean, there is love there. I mean, to be angry about something means that you had to have had an immense amount of love for that thing to begin with. Oh, you're right. Absolutely. And so it's like, it, even when, even in the darker elements, there's still love. And I think that's, you know, hearing you talk about, you know, your, how much you enjoy writing the characters of, of Thomas and Bowie. And I really, you can kind of, you know, easily make, put these, you know, love threads with the different characters. And that one, it did take a beat before I was like, no, no, this is a lover. This is just another form of love. Like there, yes, there's like hatred there, but it's, there once wasn't. And mm-hmm. that sort of, that fuel for that, like that revenge that again, that like all consuming came from a pe- place of love. And so again, mm-hmm. it's just love reform. It's like it all, it all, it all starts, you know, with love. And so to hear you kind of say like, we should organize our life by love and to understand love in all its different forms, you know, and how it can manifest maybe in good ways or bad. <laughs> but if that's how we understand where it came from, it is a simple way to sort of understand life, organize life, however you want to say. <laughs> and it was a great organizing principle for, for yeah. a book to think is, is there, is there a love story here? Even if, um, you know, it is, it's not a, it's not what we would think of as a passionate love or a sexual love, but, but to think what is, what is the love story here? And there are many. (laughs) So your magic system is very interesting. Um, And I love um, delving into new magic systems. And I love that your magic system was sort of, there was this, um, like it's centered around a hunger that like magic is, that you it's like a hunger and that you consume and that's how you kind of create. How did you come to that? How were you like, this is how I'm going to create my magic system. I'm always fascinated by how, I mean, cause it's infinite. You can do anything, but to yeah. say like, this is my magic and it can do infinite things. And it's like a, but it comes from a place of consumption. Like it comes, it, you have to consume, you have this hunger to order to create. Yeah. And that you have to live with. I had spent a, many, many years thinking about, what magic stands in for. I don't love when it is too clear what the real world correlation is for something that is fantastic. I don't want to think that there is a one-on-one relationship, let's say, Mm -hmm. between a vampire and, you know, whether it's sickness or some specific kind of trauma. I want there to feel that there is a dimension there that is larger than just the vampire is a metaphor for something yeah at the same time i think when you work with a fantastic you have to recognize that people are going to make their own correlations uh between what a fantastic element in a book might relate to in the real world and they're gonna go for the thing where it it resonates the most with them yeah that's true for the writer as well that the writer is coming in uh with a sense of um Something that troubles them or interests them about the real world, something that maybe a fantastic element would change, you know, or dramatize or maybe um, replace, you know, you're looking, what are, how would this work in the real world? And so obviously magic is always kind of a stand in for power, right? That some people have, some people don't, some people have more of it. And Oftentimes, I think that that kind of stands in for money, you know, for Mm -hmm. wealth. Some people have a lot of magic. Some people have very little. The more you have, the better off you are. And I think what I wanted to do a little bit was to sort of bring bring part of that into greater relief. The thing about money, (laughs) thing about money is the thing about money. (laughs) If you have enough of it, it creates more of it, right? Yes. And so I thought the thing about magic school is, you know, we have this idea that magic school should always be really complicated. And sure, maybe sometimes it is. But what if you had sort of a magic system where 
you know, anybody who had been given access to it could sort of create more of it. You know, yeah. what if what if the limitations were not not as complicated as they often are? And then the thing is, once you take an idea with that and sort of run with it, you think, well, there are complications here. They're just not the complications that you would normally normally think of. You yes. know, it's not that it's free. Uh, it's just that it it changes you as a person in the same way that I think unlimited access to money would change a person, right? Absolutely. And or power to your or power. Point. Yeah. Yeah. I do think that these kids in the book are special in the same way that all kids are special. You know, any if you write about a person, you're writing about that person because they're special. But they don't, and I don't think it's a spoiler to say this, but they're not given access to magic because they're special. They are given access to magic because there's something that somebody wants from them. Yes. So it is. It is. It's a little bit of a, it's a tool yeah. that's being wielded. Yes. Yeah. And that doesn't mean it wouldn't be super cool to have it. it would no, be it doesn't. No. And I think that it, what's what's great is kind of, you know, watching these characters figure that out for themselves. Like figure that out, that this is a tool. And yes, I'm being used, but that doesn't mean that I can't take that power back and yield right. it for something else. Right. Um, and I think that's that journey that our our lovely our lovely children our lovely teenagers go through <laughs> is maddening at times but also very satisfying at the end to sort of see it it, it kind of almost made me feel like the kids are going to be all right at the at the end <laughs> the choices you know like i was like okay all right all right we're going to be okay you know there's something wonderful that that holly black once said to me about um the kind of the 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 virtue maybe of writing about people as they're going through adolescence is when they screw up, um, it's terrible, but you don't think, well, that's it forever. You know, you, you screwed up, it's over. You think the kids are going to get a second chance. You know, they, they get a second act. They may in fact end up being very different people from the people who made the mistake that we're reading about. Whereas when you read a book about a person in middle age, messing up in a big way you think well that's it you know yeah. <laughs> it's gonna be hard to come back from that one <laughs> and that made me um you know I think it's writing about anybody in adolescence one you know it's a liminal space it's a space in which great change is possible you're writing about people who are figuring out things about themselves and they're really excited about it so they make wonderful protagonists but also Anyone who's reading a book has gone through adolescence, right? You know, it's a it's kind of a, a country that everybody has visited. And I think that's not as true. The experience of middle age maybe is, and I'm not saying that it's you don't have a singular experience as a as as a teenager. You do, but I think because when adult readers encounter um adolescent protagonists, you know, it's a little bit like uh, I found it very hard to write about Northampton or or the place where I live now for about 20 years. It took me a while to figure out how to write about Massachusetts. And I think I had to be here a certain time, amount of time. And at least for me as a writer, it, is t- it took me a, a long time to figure out how to write about experiences that I went through. And so maybe when I'm 90, I'll be writing a lot more stories about middle-aged people. <laughs> But uh, you, know, you just move, move that benchmark forward. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's something about that, that territory or that country of, of adolescence, which, um, you know, I am ready to go back and think about some of the ways that, that I was a person in the world yeah, when I was a teenager. For me, it was having children, I think makes it like, I'm sure everyone thinks about their adolescence, but it definitely makes, I think it put it more into focus. Yes. Of of who of the things I did and the ideals I had and who I thought I was, again, it all had a purpose because it you know it leads you to kind of you know who you are and and, and where you see yourself now. I love that you just said you're like oh you know the kids are gonna get like or you know their kids are gonna be all right because I will tell you this entire book I did not know if the kids were going to <laughs> be all right. You know, and I think this is this is this is a great thing. Um, you know, when you do get to experience it, because I think when you read so many books, you can't help but kind of start to 
oh, I think I know where this is going. Oh, I think I, I you know, I can see this is this is going to happen. And I, I think maybe because of the fantastical element and because of the rules of this game that they were playing and the, how it was going to work out, I will, I will say up and like to the last what a couple chapters when it when it finally starts to you know everything's things are starting to settle. I had no idea what was happening. <laughs> I knew everything was going to be all right. And I knew it might not be all right, but like, you know, what is all right? Like, is it going, exactly. is it all right for that character? Like, is it going, <laughs> like, is that, except, like maybe if for someone else that would not be acceptable, but for that character, like that, that sort of ending was going to be okay for them. Or that's what, that's the ending that they needed, whether well, I wanted it for them or not. So thank you for that, for keeping me, uh, (laughs) for keeping me very like, what is happening? And like, is this, are they going to be, you know, these decisions and is everything going to eventually fall into place again? Not necessarily in a neat way, but in a way that it's going to, you know, it has to, in a way that is good for, for those characters or for, for what they, for what they needed, for what their journey needed to be. So love that. Thank you. Speaking of love and uh-huh. other things in the book, I wanted to talk to you about music. So there's a lot of music references throughout the story. I loved thinking about that it was like John Cage to Taylor Swift and Barry Manilow to St. Vincent. Um, and our characters, our main protagonists, they're in a band. So how has music influenced you or influenced your writing? Um, you know, just in general, but also when you were when you were writing this, did you have like a playlist uh, in your head? I do. I I because this book took eight years to finish. The playlist evolved over time. Yes. Uh, but yes, I listen to music when I work. I find it very hard to work without some kind of background noise. Uh, and music is is sort of the the best the best noise you can you can sort of put in your ears. At mm-hmm. least for me. So there are actually two playlists. One on Spotify, one on Apple Music that go along with with the book. And Wonderful. It's not quite the entire playlist that I listened to while I was working on the Book of Love, but it is representative. Uh, and that was a lot of fun to to sort of make those make those public. Yeah, um, and I but- think. Yeah, because you hear I mean, you talk about songs and it does it like when you listen to a song, it transports you based on how you're feeling for that so your feelings for that song puts you in a different mindset and then that can just I think that's just incredible because every reader then comes to it differently yeah and it, it is part of the reason also why the book is quite long because uh <laughs> you know music is is collaborative even mm-hmm. a lot of the time at least there are you know singer songwriters who do everything themselves but but the effect of music is still uh often Choral, you know, that there's more than just one voice, more than just one guitar, that in the same way that the characters have different relationships with music, some of them are in a band together. I wanted there to be a kind of choral effect in the novel to have all of these different voices and rhythms the way that you you have in music. Just create that as much as I could in, in a book. There is that thread. And I feel like that, you know, it does flow. It does feel like, it does feel like a song. And I, because there are different elements to your point. There's, there's, I mean, there's like a classical component and do you have a character who just wants to play, you know, every instrument that he can get his hands on versus, you know, then the, again, the collaborative, the band, um, which had uh, wonderful names. Uh, <laughs> that, that would, I'm going to see if I can remember my hands both know you. My, my two hands both my know two you. My two hands both know you. A fabulous name <laughs> for a band. And then it, the fact that it just like ties into their the characters' names is just, is I love, I, I uh, love a good pun. So I will always <laughs> very much appreciate that. But it does, it just, and I, you know, of course I can't help but then like, oh, it's just music is a love language in itself. And, you know, and it's this sort of like gift that we give ourselves, that we give, give each other. There's also karaoke, and that is, I guess, another form of music um, that we that we can enjoy. Uh, it's you know not always doesn't always have to be terrible, but I think it's fun, and I think it's just again like a silly kind of a release of whatever we're feeling, whether we want to um, shout from the rooftops or you know sing a sad song. So I'm going to ask you 
Do you enjoy karaoke? And if so, do you have a go-to song? Because it felt like a lot of the characters in here had their own go-to songs, which makes me think is one of these go-to songs, your go-to song. Oh, I feel that you've seen right through me. Um, (laughs) I do. I do love karaoke. One of the things that I love about it is, you know, whether you are at a karaoke night with good friends or with people that you don't know that well, but you've all gone out together, uh, you sort of learn a lot about somebody you don't know by the way they sing, by their sort of attitude about singing by what they pick. And with friends that you do know and you hear them sing, it's often a real surprise. You think, I didn't know you could sing or, (laughs) oh man, I didn't know that you couldn't sing, but that was still amazing. (laughs) Um, But I also love it because I don't think that music should always be professional um, or serious. You know, I, I think that people bring a lot of themselves to a song when they sing at karaoke and they change that song for me. I don't know if you've ever listened to somebody sing a song and you think oh, I've yeah. never thought about that song before that way. No. But now I will never be able to stop. Again, and it's it, it's similar in a way where, you know, everyone can read a book and they interpret it in their own way. And then, you know, you are here listening to your favorite songs and you obviously are interpreting them with that, you know, in a certain way and why you somehow think that the world interprets them in the same way. And then, yeah, Mm -hmm. it takes karaoke is the, it breaks all down all walls um, and shows us the true selves. And the fact that, yeah, it can be music is, is interpreted just like stories, just like anything else. It's beauty is in the eye of the beholder. It's it's, It's a community activity. It is. (laughs) You're not allowed to be, you know, you have to get over your fear or your shame, which I think is, is always wonderful that, you know, people will celebrate you for being brave since apple music i think put in the thing where you can uh look at the lyrics to a song yes you know at least for our household it means there's a lot there there are occasional karaoke nights yes uh but my go-to public number is um elton john's goodbye yellow brick road it's a good one that's a good one it's a lot of fun to sing out loud yeah (laughs) and it's like (laughs) it's got like decent you could listen like belting you got like it's some like, like a belter a of, yeah there's a lot of emotion there you can do quiet you can get big I like that I like that and you know it's got the incredible line um back to the howling old owl in the wood hunting the horny back toad and I just I have to celebrate any song that has that lyric in it it's an amazing <laughs> thing to get to sing out loud <laughs> wonderful so you, again, we started this conversation talking about, um, you know, you were sort of this, the short story writer. This is sort of a place that you really, you know, enjoyed writing. You enjoy writing these short stories. And now you've written this, I feel like, <laughs> 600, 640 page novel. So what are the highs? What are, what, what are the highs? What are the lows versus each? What was something, was there something you missed when you were writing this that you were like, oh. If I was writing a short story, this is what I would be doing right now. Or this is the high I'm like I'm missing. It's it's it was a little bit like those highway ads that you used to see for for residential neighborhoods. If you lived here, you'd be home by now. <laughs> so I would think if I was writing a short story, like I'd be done by now. I'd like, be done. <laughs> <laughs> and so I would. I would go. I would sneak off and and write a short story, which is how I ended up with the collection. I was going to say, I, I, read, yeah. I read a little something you wrote about um, how yeah. this, how, how white dog, uh, how white, sorry, white cat, black dog came about. And I thought that's so funny because I feel like every single one of us can identify with that procrastinate. Like when you're, oh yeah, have a project and you're just like, I, like, I need to break down into bites. I just can't work on this right now. And then you oh, just yeah. end up doing some other tasks. Cause you're like, well, this, well, I can do this and it will make me feel good. And then I will go back. And I was like, wow, you literally wrote a collection of short stories. <laughs> that was yeah. your like <laughs> procrastination <laughs> task. You're like, I'm going to do this, which is equally just amazing. But the fact that, you know, most people's procrastination task is like, I'm going to wash the dishes or I'm going to clean. I mean, I do that too. I would, you know, procrastinate from the novel by writing the short story, but then I would procrastinate from the short story by doing some dishes, which... Nobody in your house is going to complain if you're like, I'm sorry, I was procrastinating by doing the dishes. They're going to be like, this seems good. I, know, I think that's why it is like, 
well, I'm doing this and it's not what I should be doing, but it it is, it it's is virtuous. It, right. Right? it does add value to my surrounding, to my family, yeah. to whomever. Again, I feel like I'm being very greedy asking this, but you did sort of tease to it a little bit. Um, not that you haven't just written a 640 page novel, but I was going to ask what's, <laughs> what's next? Not that this isn't, not that you shouldn't, uh, you know, take a break, but you did tease to it. So I am going to ask because you did tease to it. I I have about half of a middle grade finished, which has a little bit of magic in it. It's set in Western Massachusetts, and I need to go back to that. But I also uh, have been thinking about a, a very short novel, and it sounds weird to call something a ghost story novel, but I'm not sure there's really a better descriptor. It's it's uh, like Susan Hill's the The Woman in Black. It's going to be a very short ghost novel. And in part, uh, one of the things I've been enjoying and planning for is thinking about how to make it as compact as possible to write a novel that is as close to a short story as I can get it, but still do some of the essential work of the novel. So just like the opposite of what you yeah, did. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You're like, let's try something new. I love a ghost story. I think that, again, there's so many metaphors when you think of ghost stories and, and the ghosts that we all carry. And I just, I adore that. So I felt like when you said that, I was just, I'm going to be anxiously awaiting uh, whatever, whatever it turns out to be, because that sounds uh, fantastic. And I'm going to take this opportunity because I, I love to uh, always like sort of round out my interviews asking um, for book recommendations. And it's always great to hear what other people are reading, uh, other writers are reading. Um, but I feel like I have a really unique opportunity to ask you because you're a bookseller. Mm. So you have, you're a writer, but you're a bookseller too. So I feel like this is a really, this is a treat for me. Um, so I'm going to ask you what books have you read or what are you reading now um, that you just, you just couldn't stop talking about because I just can't stop talking about your book. So let's see what is on your mind. There is a recent novel, maybe it came out right before Christmas. Um called The Astonishing Confessions of Lydia Bennett Witch by Melinda Taub. Yep. Which is in the, you know, literally following uh, Jane Austen's character. And it is uh, sweet. It is witty. It is surprising and, and was just a delight. And so I've been selling a lot of that. Lydia, Lydia gets a bad rap. She gets oh. a... <laughs> Yes, clearly. Um, and, and now is one of my favorite characters, you know, thanks to the work of this novel, um, Linda Taub's work. I'm reading Bora Chung's new collection. I loved Cursed Bunny. Yes. Or Cursed Bunny. Would you say Cursed, Cursed Bunny? Cursed Bunny. Yes. I believe Cursed, Cursed Bunny. Yes. And the new collection, Your Utopia. Yes. Which yes. Is... I'm really excited about that. Yes. Um, and then there's a writer um, who's published many books and the most recent one uh, was called The Black Tongue Thief, Michael Buhlman. And I was unfamiliar with his books. And now I have read every single one because I liked The Black Tongue Thief so much. He works in all different genres. He has a, a vampire novel. He has a medieval saints and, and devils novel called Between Two Fires. Um, and then this new one is is an epic fantasy. Uh, and I think there is a second book set in that world coming soon. Um, but I absolutely loved that. And then the book that we saw a ton of at the, the bookstore, because we love it so much, is an older book, Molly Gloss's historical novel, The Hearts of Horses. Mm -hmm. And that is always my go-to pick when somebody comes in and says that they have kind of lost the joy of reading or if they're giving a book to somebody who just doesn't always enjoy reading. You know, it's a novel about a young woman as World War I is sort of on the horizon. She is writing from ranch to ranch in Oregon, uh, breaking horses. So it's about this community of ranchers. Uh, it's, it's kind of a love story. Uh, the descriptions of, of horses and her relationships with them are phenomenal, but uh, it is the book that I give to people where I hear back. Um, oh, I loved that. We have a lot of shelf talkers in our store, but um, 
we have a shelf talker for that book and it says I didn't know I would love a book about horses this much and then it's something like <laughs> um Annie's grandpa that's <laughs> Some customer wrote that for us. They're like, my grandfather, I love this book so much. <laughs> I love that. And I love, see, this is, and this is, you know, when you talk to booksellers, it's like, you know, we are so attuned to sort of tailoring our picks to what yeah. the person is saying, you know, or what do you like, you know, or you can kind of almost get an idea when they're talking to you, like what they might like, what are they holding in their hands? You know, what are they, what did they say the last great book they read was? But then there is always that. I think every bookseller has that, that book where it's like, if they're like, I don't know, I just, I mean, I'm in a funk. I don't know what to read. And you're like, okay. And like every right. bookseller has that sort of go-to, like, I don't know if I've ever met anyone that hasn't loved this book, you know, and, and yeah. for, for a multitude of reasons. Um, but I feel like only a bookseller would say that. Like only a bookseller would have that, like, oh, I've got that book that nobody, <laughs> nobody would think they would love or that surprise pick that like, but then everyone does love it. So this has been a real treat. I love talking to you as an author. I love talking to you as a bookseller. I'm so excited that we've gotten to talk about this. This Again, I'm going to say generous, <laughs> generous novel. And I'm so excited for more people to, to come to The Book of Love. So Kelly, thank you. This has been a real treat. And The Book of Love is out now. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. Poured Over is a Barnes & Noble production. To help other readers find us, please rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts.